In segment two, we considered the geometric and topological concepts that are central to the development of the following hypothesis. At all hierarchical levels, the entity events that exist in the universe are linked to one another by a universal network or manifold of interlinked small circuit platens. This is not an entirely new idea. It was alluded to as a component of a vortex theory of the universe developed by René Descartes in the 1600s. Descartes' universe was much more limited in scope than our present perceptions. The prevailing theology in the 1600s required a finite universe regulated by a supreme being. In addition to this, Descartes' universe consisted primarily of simply planets and stars. There were no galaxies, black holes, red dwarfs, novas, these sorts of ideas. Here is Descartes' illustration of his concept of how events on a large scale relate to one another. <clears throat> to paraphrase him, there are as many different heavens as there are stars, and since the number of stars is indefinite, so too is the number of heavens, and the firmament is just a surface without thickness, separating all of the heavens from one another. As you can see, Descartes' firmament is composed of small circuit platens. From the content of segment two, you may have some feeling for the idea that nature's strategies throughout evolution tends toward maximum economy, multiple functions, integration, and hierarchical organizations. In segment two, hierarchies appeared in illustrations of different levels of packed and clustered polyhedra. Let's look at this again. At the most economical level, we see every external shell of clustered soft spheres depicted here as truncated octahedra, surrounding a central unit. Each shell redefines the same form, the rhombic dodecahedron. Now, rhombic dodecahedra at a less economical hierarchical level pack in the same way that hard spheres pack, and exterior shells of this packing continually redefine another form, the cube octahedron, and this form at still a less economical level packs with octahedra and so on. All of these packings and clusters coordinated by small circuit platens. Using these hierarchical models from catenetic geometry as a general analogy, we can imagine a map of the universe. This map system can account for both the position and the hierarchical levels of entity events in space as well as the structure of space itself. A map of this intricacy goes beyond simply ascertaining the locations of entity events in space, but takes into account how entity events interact with the structural nature of space, such as the ability of space to flow around entity events. So let's imagine for the moment a steady state, non-growing universe. We have a star composed of a bubbling mass of interacting somethings, entity events, each of which has a boundary of small circuit platens that interact with other small circuit platens of neighboring events. Each star in the system has a spatial domain with an exterior boundary of platens, each of which interacts with domain boundary platens of other stars living in the galaxy. Each galaxy in turn has a spatial domain with an exterior boundary of small circuit platens that interact with small circuit platens of neighboring galaxies and so on throughout the great and minuscule levels in this grand system we call the universe. Now what about space? In addition to its gravitational nature, does space have a structure <clears throat> composed of very minute space particles, space atoms? Let's speculate that it does have a grainy structure of some sort. So what size are these grains, particles, atoms of space? Current thinking in physics sets the smallest distance or size of an entity event about which anything can be known at 1.616 times 10 to the minus 35th meters, termed the Planck length. A very small size indeed when you consider that a single atom is 24 orders of magnitude larger than the Planck length. 
The Planck length comes from an equation containing three important universal constants, the Planck constant, the observed speed of light in a vacuum, and the gravitational constant. We'll have more to say about each of these as we continue. So as a first cut, we can imagine the grainy structure of space to resemble the tensional economy of a bubble froth of linked small circuit platens that we've discussed earlier. Interacting with other linked small circuit platens of larger entity events, stars, galaxies, galaxy clusters, universes, and so on at one end, and molecules, atoms, protons, neutrons, electrons, quarks, mesons, and the like at the other end of a continuous hierarchical spectrum. We began this vis visualization with the assumption that the universe was steady state, but it is not. It is dynamic. The current thinking is that it is growing and growing at an accelerating rate. I use the term growing rather than expanding for good reason, because from our catanetic geometry perspective, the growth of space resembles more of an organic growth process rather than a process of expansion or stretching. The growth of space is a local, accumulative, and an integrative process that manifests universally. How does this work? What is the engine or force that drives this growth? In order to describe this, I use some basic geometry and topology because the answer is fundamentally a ge geometry and topology answer. The energy component can naturally come from these visuals. But to develop a perspective here, let's begin with some history. Albert Einstein developed the general theory of relativity between 1905 and 1920. He believed, as did most people, that the universe was in a steady state, not growing, not shrinking. Based on this assumption, Albert needed to include a certain something, the cosmological constant, to balance his field equations. But by the mid-1920s, astronomer Edwin Hubble concluded from very careful observations of the light spectral redshift in galaxy movement that the universe was actually increasing in size. This obviously threw at least part of Albert's theory into serious doubt. He considered the inclusion of the cosmological constant in his equations for general relativity to be the greatest blunder of his life. While Albert used it to maintain his assumption of a steady state universe, it is for us today a key or a manifestation at least for the enabling energy or engine that drives the growth of the universe. But what is it? Today, the Hubble constant, H sub zero, gives partial reference to the velocity of growth of the universe and is part of the standard lexicon of astronomy. However, the value of H has been subject the subject of discussion and reevaluation since the 1920s. The estimated value of the basic growth rate has changed from 50 to 100 kilometers per second per milliparsec since that time, depending on the assumptions and measuring techniques. Of late, though, astronomers have been honing in on an agreed experimental value. And it is here that I must ask you to relax strict notions of the scientific method and return to the realm of pure theory. Let me say at the outset that I make the assumption that space is composed of grains or particles and that the assiduous energy and growth of space at platen boundaries is the fifth fundamental force of nature. I'm going to continue this line of thought in the next part, segment four, so stay tuned to this catanetic channel.